Hi guys, this is Mrs. Foy and hold on to your seats because we are going to start the immune system for AP biology. We do this when we study the cell unit because the culmination of all that you've learned about the cell and how the cell communicates and how the cell functions um, is the perfect way to cap off this unit by talking about a whole system a whole system just made of cells. So I hope you enjoy this lecture. It's part of two lectures and we're gonna go ahead and get started. So one thing that I wanna say is that there is just no way that you can understand everything that you need to understand about the immune system by viewing this lecture one time. You just can't. Um, you're going to need to go back and um, look through the slides again, and you may have to listen to this lecture again. You definitely are going to need to process your notes and distill them because this is a lot. All right, so here we go, the immune system. So the first thing we need to talk about are what are the things that are attacking us? And we call those things pathogens. So a pathogen is, is something that can make you sick. And we have four basic types of pathogens. We have bacteria, which you know are cells and of, of themselves. We have viruses that are non-living particles that hijack our cells and need our cells to uh, be able to um, reproduce. We have some fungi that are pathogenic, that can make us sick. So if you talk about a, a yeast infection or ringworm or something like that. And then we also have some proteast or some protozoans, which are one-celled organisms that can make us sick, like um, the uh, protease that causes malaria um, and also um, giardia, which is uh, something that causes uh, uh, diarrhea. So what is the function of the immune system? So the immune system is a body system. So it's just like your digestive system or your respiratory system, but it is a system of cells um, and a few organs that work together to destroy pathogen, pathogens. And their job is to detect and kill abnormal cells as well and to remove dead cells and debris, kind of clean, clean up after the war, so to speak. And so you can see that we do have some organs. So we have an organ called the thymus that is a large organ that um, actually shrinks with age, but it's over your heart. We have the spleen, we have lymph nodes, your appendix is, uh, and your tonsils and your adenoids are also part of the system and your bone marrow is also. So we're going we're gonna to talk about all those different uh, types of tissues. So how do these pathogens get in? There's a couple of different ways that they can attack. They can get in through our digestive system. They can get in through our respiratory system. They can get in through our urogenital tract, okay? They can get in through a break in our skin. And once they get in, they can circulate in our body, in our blood, which is part of our circulatory system, or they can spread around in another type of fluidy system called the lymphatic system. And we're gonna be talking about that as well. The lymphatic system is basically fluid that is interstitial fluid that collects in between cells. Um, and uh, that is filtered by our lymph nodes. So we're gonna talk more about that in just a minute. The blood though is really important because blood is liquid tissue, right? It's liquid tissue. So uh, most of blood is water and other um, important chemicals that we call plasma, but we have three basic kinds of cell in our, cells in our blood. We have red blood cells, whose job it is to just transport oxygen and carbon dioxide. We have white blood cells whose job it is to act in our immune system. We'll talk about that a lot. And then we also have these cell fragments called platelets, which are uh, important for blood clotting. 
So an old fashioned word that we still use today, unfortunately, because it's confusing for students is called a humor. So this word humor um, means a fluid of the body and fluids would include blood and also lymph. So you're gonna hear us talk about the humoral immunity system. So this would be the humors of the body. So we're gonna talk a little bit about blood. So the cells in blood come from the grandparent cell called the pluri, pluripotent hemopoietic cell. So all of these different types of cells here, erythrocytes are red blood cells, platelets we just talked about, but all of these other guys are what we would call white blood cells. And there's two major groups of them. I want to point out that if somebody has a bone marrow transplant, you may have heard of that. If they have a bone marrow transplant, it's probably because they um, are being treated for some type of blood cancer where either a, by chemicals or radiation would destroy the bone marrow to try to get rid of any um, lingering cancer cells. And then you would need a bone marrow transplant to be able to repopulate all of these cells in your body. You can donate your own bone marrow that has been treated or sometimes you can get it from a donor. So there are two main types of white blood cells that we're gonna talk about in this immunity lecture. There are leukocytes and lymphocytes, okay? So leukocytes is kind of a, a general term that describes all of these different types of um, white blood cells. And lymphocytes is a subcategory of white blood cells that are specifically T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes, and these things called plasma cells that produce antibodies. So you might notice um, when, you, when you look at these um, that they all have very specific names, basophils, mast cells, neutrophils, eosinophils, monocytes and macrophages, and dendritic cells. You're gonna hear these as kind of like a cast of characters in a play. And so you're going to learn more about these and how they work. So another way, if you take a course in histology or um, if you are training to be a lab technologist, you need to look under the microscope and be able to tell that these look different. And so one of the ways that we um, can classify them is if they have little granules in their cytoplasm or if they don't. So we call these a uh, group of leukocytes granulocytes, and these agranulocytes include lymphocytes, about 20 to 25 percent of these leukocytes, these white blood cells, are lymphocytes, and they are either T cells, B cells, or natural killer cells, which we'll talk about. Monocytes develop into macrophages, which are the big cell eaters. And then these guys over here, these granulocytes have other specific jobs as well. So in general, what is phagocytosis? Phagocytosis, you know, means cell eating. And so in general, the way this is going to happen is we have some type of microbe that these specific cells would engulf or phagocytize and that creates a vacuole inside the cell. The vacuole would then fuse with a lysosome that is, remember, the organelle that is carrying these very destructive enzymes um, that if they were to get out, they would kill the cell. And sometimes that's what programmed cell death is, is a program that the lysosome would then, the membrane would um, dissolve and those those enzymes would kill the cell. But in this case, they would fuse with our vacuole and they would degrade and break down chemically that um, microbe that we engulfed. So the phagocytes in general are three different categories. They are the granulocytes that we talked about, the, the part of the leukocytes that have little uh, granules in them, like neutrophils would be one of the major ones. These are going to attack invaders and they are going to eat phagocytes until they die. 
pus we know is white and actually these leukocytes are white if you spin down blood you can separate it into the plasma which is the liquid which looks kind of like a yellow straw color a very thin layer of white stuff that is the leukocytes the white blood cells and then the red which is the red blood cells Anyway, these leukocytes are going to eat meat, meat until they die, and that's what pus is. Pus is the dead bodies of those leukocytes along with um, some dead particles of the um, pathogen that they ate. The macrophages are the big eaters. So these are a little slower to respond than the granulocytes are, but they live longer, they're larger, and they, they have more eating capacity. Dendritic cells are also eater cells, um, and they, along with macrophages, have another role to play in the immune system in, in that they activate other parts of the immune system. So you need to keep them in mind um, as you're taking notes. So let's talk about the lymphatic system. I think the lymphatic system is fascinating. Um, I always think of the lymphatic system as like a sewer system. So if you think about all of the water that collects on a city street, you know those little grates that you see? Well, the water goes down in there and the water is then collected in pipes and those pipes go to the sewage uh, system treatment center in your town or city. And that's kind of like what the lymphatic system is. In our tissues, we have um, liquid that surrounds the cells, and we call that interstitial fluid. Well, that interstitial fluid sometimes gets back into the blood vessels, but it also can go into these lymphatic vessels. And the lymphatic vessels kind of filter the lymph um, through these um, little uh, uh, collections of tissue called lymph nodes. And there are special cells that hide out there, right? Because don't you think pathogens might be in the lymph? Yeah. And so that's where we're going to see a lot of our um, uh, special immune tissues that uh, hang out in those lymph nodes. So I've got a couple of elbow question partners, uh, partner questions for you to answer. Because we're not in class right now, I'm just gonna ask you to pause the video and make sure that you can answer these questions. So just pause it real quickly and make sure that you can answer these important questions. All right, so now let's get started. Hopefully by now you have watched the Bozeman Biology Dan Anderson video on introduction to the immune system. It is fabulous. Um, I just watched it again myself. Um, and so he breaks down the immune system into like protect, protecting a castle, right? Like, a, like the, protecting your body. And he says that the external defense would be like the castle walls. So that would be like cilia and mucus in your skin and wax and tears. All of those things are the outermost barrier. The innate internal defense would be what he says are like guards or soldiers. So if the enemy breaches the castle walls, you have something to fight with. So these would be generic fighters. They often determine whether something is a foe or a friend by what kind of antigens are on the surface, which we'll talk about. But they're not specific. They'll just kind of fight anybody that's foreign. And do you see this word innate? That's really important. That means something that you are born with. It doesn't, it doesn't develop, it's just something you have. And all animals have an innate defense system. And a lot of plants have it as well. But what puts us vertebrates above in a category all our own is that we have the acquired or adaptive or specific immune system. And these are what Bozeman calls spies. So these are going to be the very specific trained fighters that are specific to that type of invader that would go and kill those invaders. Unfortunately, scientists call this type of the immune system by all three names. It's very confusing. I apologize, but you have to know all three. 
So acquired, adaptive, or a specific immune system is talking about the system that only vertebrates have. And this is the B lymphocytes, which are part of the humoral immunity. Do you remember humoral means body humors or fluid like blood and lymph? And the cell-mediated response, which is championed by the T lymphocytes, which we'll talk about. Cell-mediated means it's killing cells. Why would you want something to kill cells? You're right, if they are invaded by a pathogen. So the T lymphocytes kill our own body cells that have been invaded. And you might think, wow, would they kill cancer cells too? Yes, you're right. And the B lymphocytes are going to be killing pathogens in our humors, in our blood and lymph. So this is, a, um, this is a image in your textbook that I would highly, highly um, suggest that you have out because it kind of shows you um, the different parts and some of the different players of the innate immunity versus the adaptive immunity. And it basically talks about what parts there are and who the major players are. So the innate immunity is just kind of generic. It's not a specific um, defense force. And it's very quick, all right? So it's not specific, but it's very quick. It's not very long lasting, but it's very quick. The adaptive immunity that only vertebrates have is very specific. It is a targeted killing system to specific pathogens. And because it's specific, it is more... Um, it is more productive, but it's slower to respond, all right? Because you have to build up to it. And so you're going, we're gonna be learning more about these. So this, this is kind of your big overall. If you get lost, go back to this diagram and try to find out where you are, so to speak. So first of all, what are vertebrates? Could you circle the vertebrates in this picture? I don't wanna put you on the spot, but you might, you might have a hard time. Vertebrates are animals that have backbones, right? So this snake is a vertebrate, this frog is a vertebrate, this lizard is a vertebrate. This scorpion and this centipede are invertebrates. They do not have a internal backbone. They have a exoskeleton. So they would not have an acquired immunity. They would have innate immunity though right? So all animals have this innate immunity, which is really interesting, right? So let's look at these physical barriers we talked about. That would be like the castle gate. Bloodborne. So these are going to be the, um, some of the leukocytes that we talked about, neutrophils, macrophages, basophils. These guys are going to either kill the, um, the invader themselves, so it could be, you know, some type of, 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 of um, uh, it could be a protease, it could be a, a bacteria, um, and they use the actual phagocytic cells, so they eat the bad guys, but they can also use chemical warfare, which is called the complement system. And the complement system um, basically makes it easier for these phagocytes to go around and sweep up and eat all the pathogens. The acquired immunity is, remember, only the vertebrates have this. This is our crowning glory as, as vertebrates. So we divide it into two separate parts, our B cell immunity, which is our humor, a humoral response in our blood humors, and these are gonna be the B cells and the plasma cells that we're gonna talk about. And then our T cell immunity, which is going to, there are certain types of T cells we'll talk about, but we are killing cells in the T cell or cell mediate immunity. It's killing cells, all right? So this is another diagram that I would highly recommend that you draw because it helps you kind of figure out where you are when we're talking about this very complex immune system. So I just want to talk a little bit about invertebrates just so that you, you know, can look at that spider and be amazed that it has an immune system too. So the exoskeleton, remember, is made of chitin and that would be a particular barrier. And the um, 
lysozyme is an enzyme that breaks down bacterial cell walls, right? So that would make sense that these um, invertebrates would have that. And they also have a certain cells that are phagocytosis, so they would go and eat bacteria and other pathogens that these invertebrates would have. And they also have particular antimicrobial peptides, right, that would disrupt the plasma membranes of fungi and bacteria that might be um, fighting them. So again, let's keep straight whether we're talking about our innate internal defenses or we're talking about the adaptive or specific defenses, in which case we would be talking about B cells and T cells and something that um, that we call memory T cells and B cells. So we have something as vertebrates called immunity. And that means that once our um, acquired or specific immune system revs up its response, part of that response is making memory cells that are specific to that pathogen. So if we are ever infected with that pathogen again, we have something already tailor-made to kill it. And it's also systemic. That just means it's throughout the whole body. So what is an antigen? An antigen, the word antigen comes from antibody generating. So it's usually a protein. It could be a glycoprotein. It could be a lipoprotein. But it's usually some kind of a protein that elicits a response of an antibody against it. I like to think of an antigen as a cell label, okay? So just like my shirt has a label on it that tells me what kind of t-shirt it is, an antigen is kind of like a cell label. And that's really important, right? Because the cells are all communicating, like, who are you? Well, who are you? Are you friend of foe? Are you friend of foe? Well, how do we know that? We know that by the antigens. So all cells have antigens that basically tell us what kind of cell they are. So an antigen is going to be, um, like I said, on all cell surfaces. Infectious organisms, these would be our pathogens, bacteria, viruses, some protozoan. Um, this is a little protozoan, I think, that causes African sleeping sickness, as you've, you've ever heard of that. And helminths is the fancy word for worms. So like a tapeworm or something like that would also be infectious. These would have antigens on them that our body would recognize as foreign and infectious. They can spread, and we would attack them. But we also have non-infectious antigens. So we have antigens on our cells in our body that are there. We have food antigens. There's pollen, dust. There are some uh, venoms and some insect toxins also are act as antigens that our immune system would respond against. And autoimmune diseases, guys, right? When your body somehow starts to attack itself, are attacking our own antigens. And that's obviously not a good thing. Same thing with food allergens. So let's look a little more in depth at our, our first uh, line of defense. So this would be our skin, okay? We have learned about desmosomes and tight junctions and keratin. Keratin is kind of a waterproofing protein that is on the cell surface. All of those things act as barriers. Mucus, tears, human milk, by the way, um, also has got some defenses in it, and saliva as well. And then we have other chemical secretions. We've already talked about these lysozymes that we saw that were in the invertebrates, remember I talked about? Their job is to break down peptidoglycan walls. Think back to our gram stain lab. Do you remember the word peptigo, peptidoglycan? Right? So that's part of bacterial cell walls. So we don't want that around, right? And so, unless they're good bacteria. But that is, that's what lysozyme would break down. So our non-specific defenses would be our skin and these other um, fluids that we talked about. If a pathogen gets past that, 
Then we have our second line of defense, but these are nonspecific. What's another word for that? Innate, our innate immune system. So phagocytosis, complement, and then we have something called the inflammatory response, which we're going to talk about. That would be like if you got an infected splinter or something. But if the pathogen gets, still gets past that second line of defense, that's when we go to our specific defenses, our acquired immunity, our um, adaptive immunity, so many stupid names, but that's, that's that final level of defense. So let's talk a little bit about some, okay, so let's say something gets past our skin, our first level. Let's, let's say we've got a splinter that has left some bacteria. All right, what is going to happen? Well, the first thing that's going to happen is that we have these patrolling, patrolling phagocytic cells. These would be these granulocytes that are, that are neutrophils and macrophages that are out and they're just going to kill anything that is a pathogen. We have natural killer cells and dendritic cells that are also going to be here. But the thing about the natural killer cells and the dendritic cells is they have kind of another layer of alerting the higher acquired immunity. You're going to see later they play a very important role in recruiting our acquired immunity to become involved in a, um, in a breach of our defenses. We also have some proteins that are going to act to kind of rev up this second line of defense. One of them is um, some proteins called complement. And complement is kind of a cascading effect that leads to the lysis of microbes. And we also have some other chemical defenses that we call cytokines. There's a, it's a big category of chemicals that are kind of our chemical defense. One of them is a chemical called interferon, which you may have heard of. Um, and then we also have the inflammatory response and fever. So this is all our, part of our innate. So phagocytosis, we talked about is cell eating. We have these neutrophils, macrophages, remember these dendri dendritic cells, macrophages and dendritic cells also help to activate our adaptive immunity, immunity. These eosinophils and neutrophils are more of our innate. So they don't, um, they're, they're phagocytic cells, but they're more quick acting, not longer lasting. Well, what is complement? Complement is really interesting. You do not have to know all the details of this, all right? If when you get to medical school or nursing school, you will need to learn this. But um, I'm just showing you that it, it's going to affect, kind of activate all these different types of cells that are part of our innate and our acquired immune system. But basically what it does, and again, you do not have to know all these. I just want to want you to appreciate the beauty of this. So it is a, it is a protein um, domino effect where something activates something which activates something else. And the end result is that you have the bad cell or bacteria that ends up lysing. So it actually affects the cell membrane and causes this extracellular fluids to come in and the cell to, to lice, which is one way to get rid of it, right? These complement systems also help to activate the inflammatory process, which I'm gonna talk about in just a minute. And it also acts as part of opsonization. So opson is a Greek word that literally means a savory side dish. Okay, so what is opsonization? Opsonization is a chemical way to make it easier for the phagocytic cells to eat these bad guys. That's basically what opson, opsonization is. So we're going to talk more about this later, but I just want to show you this now. So natural killer cells and macrophages, um, this is how they they. They kind of figure out if you're friend or foe. And they have these antigens or receptors on their surface that can discern whether something is a good guy or a bad guy, all right? And they have kind of a, they kind of have like a, a, a two 
uh, a two-step safety handshake, right? So to see, to make sure before it destroys it, if it is a good guy or a bad guy. And so you can see in this particular cartoon, there we have this ubiquitous molecule. Ubiquitous just means it's everywhere. And then we have this other type of specific receptor called it MHC. And this MHC class one is a specific type of receptor that is on our normal cells. And so when a natural killer cell encounters a normal cell, it's going to have two different receptors that fit onto the normal cell antigens and it's going to say, hey, don't kill me. I am a good cell. But look at the bad guy cell or an abnormal cell would not have that MHC class one molecule here. And so because that second secret handshake didn't happen, then the natural killer cells says you're a goner. And it's going to release this chemical called perforin Perforin means perforate, so it's going to poke holes in the cell and cause that lysis. And granzymes, which are also chemicals that help the cell to be killed. So um, just again, we've already talked about neutrophil neutrophils, monocytes are transformed into macrophages. These natural killer cells are a type of lymphocyte. And so they act in our secondary defense, but they also act in our acquired defense. So let's talk a little bit about the inflammatory response, all right? So the inflammatory response is what happens when you get in something inflamed. So what does it do? Well, let's think about what it does, right? So if you have an infective splinter, it's swollen, it's hot, and it's red, all right? So all those three things are going to come into play. What does it do? It prevents the spread of the invader. It disposes of the pathogens and the dead cells, and it sets the stage for repair. So the inflammatory response has several different stages. Okay, so let's look at first. Let's look at the infected splinter here. I've got some green bacteria that ah uh, get in through the break in that cell. And what's going to happen is the macrophages that are just kind of patrolling in your, um, in your, in your tissues are going to come upon it and they are going to signal then um, other cells, these mast cells are an, an example of them. This would be part of the leukocytes. Um, send out a chemical signal that's kind of like alert, alert, it's like a fire alarm. And one of the things that happens is it, they recruit other neutrophils to have the ability to be adhesive on the inside of the red blood cells, okay? So look, here I've got a, a blood vessel, right? And in the red in this blood vessel, I've got red blood cells. Their not, job is not immunity. Their job is to, you know, transport oxygen and some and carbon dioxide. But here's a white blood cell, okay? So one of the things these chemicals do, these cytokines do, is they cause the macrophage cells to be able to stick to the side of the um, blood vessel. Isn't that cool? And then they go through something called diapedesis. This, do you see that kind of pod or ped? That means foot. So they're going to kind of, you know, use their pseudopodia, just like an amoeba, to squeeze through the little tiny gaps in the lining of our blood vessels. And they get out into the tissues and then they can destroy the green bacteria. Cytokines, there are going to be other chemicals that are going to be part of this process as well. And histamines are also going to be released. Histamines are going to um, cause some swelling. Okay, so think about it. We're going to see redness because we have increased circulation. We're going to see swelling because we have um, a release of a lot of our um, fluids that are there because we have these leaky um, blood vessels because we have our white vessels, our white blood cells that are getting through there and, and, and fighting the bad guys. So what is pus? We might see pus as well. Pus is the dead white blood cells and bacterial and fluids, all right, that we're going to see. So I would expect an AP biology student to be able to explain 
the inflammatory response, which is part of our innate immune system. So we've got the bacteria coming in. Platelets would be released um, if there was a wound there. Mast cells, we've already talked about, secrete histamines. Histo histamines vasodilate, that means they cause the blood vessels to dilate. And they also uh, cause vasoconstriction on the other ends, right? And so what does that do? Well, that delivers more blood and more fighters to the area. Neutrophils, we know, are kind of generic uh, uh, phagocytosic, uh, phagocytotic cells that are going to engulf and, and eat. Macrophages are also going to eat, but they are going to secrete some cytokines that kind of rev up everybody else. And you have this kind of frenzy of eating. And the inflammatory response then um, would continue until that foreign material was eliminated and it would set the stage for healing. So that's the inflammatory response. It, it, um, it explains red, it explains swelling, and the heat part would just be more blood that is shunted to the surface. But speaking of heat, we're also in a minute gonna talk about fever. So you do not need to memorize all of these cytokines. I just want you to look at them and see some of the really cool jobs of what they do. Chemotaxis, all right? That means a chemical that is going to attract other cells, all right? Growth and differentiation of leukocytes, right? So you would make more leukocytes if you had this interleukin. Interferon, regulation and activation of antiviral properties. Okay, so some of these things are a very important chemical warfare that our, that our body uses. So let's just talk a little bit about fever. Again, you do not have to memorize this whole um, cycle of fever, but fever is an important part of our, um, of our immune response because by increasing the temperature just a little bit, that makes it more uncomfortable for a lot of kinds of uh, pathogens. It's kind of like um, an anti-terrorist unit, you know, cutting off the air conditioning in a building that terrorists overtook. It's almost like, you know, sweating them out kind of thing. So when your tissues become infected, some of the white blood cells release a specific type of cytokine called an interleukin. Interleukin is produced by macrophages and helper T cells. That interleukin then um, causes the production of things called prostaglandins. We think of prostaglandins as associated with pain, but they're also associated with the inflammatory response. And what these specific prostaglandins do is they cross the blood-brain barrier into a specific part of the brain called the POA, the preoptic area of the brain, which resets the temperature of your body um, higher. And that's what a fever is. Isn't that cool? That's what a fever is. So I have another place for you to pause here and to answer some questions. Um, I'm going to uh, go about five more slides, but I'd like you to answer a couple of questions here. Pause the video. Make sure that you can answer these questions, okay? All right. So guys, now we're going to get to the crowning glory of our immune system, and that is the acquired immune system which is also called the adaptive immune system, which is also called the specific immune system, okay? Remember, it's called those three different things. And remember, this is a type, it's kind of a two-branch system. We have the humoral system, and we have the cell-mediated part of immunity. Both of those are under the auspices of the acquired or adaptive or specific immune system. So let's go back to the major um, roles, the major cells that we're talking about. Up until this point, guys, we have been mostly talking about these granulocytes, all right? We haven't talked about red blood cells at all. We really haven't talked about platelets, okay, except if 
platelets are involved in having to clot the blood if you have you know some type of of uh, bleeding or tearing it, as part of an injury but these guys are part of the just general phagocytic response okay and you'll learn more about those um when when you uh, when you take another uh, uh, course in college or graduate school, but now we're going to talk about these lymphocytes. Right, we have B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes, and these are going to be the B lymphocytes. Were named B actually because they um, mature in the bone marrow. All right, so B lymphocytes, bone marrow, and the T lymphocytes mature in the thymus, which remember is that organ that's right over your, um, right over your um, heart. So the B lymphocytes we're gonna see are going to be major players in the humoral response, and the T lymphocytes are gonna be major players in the cell-mediated response. So I love this cartoon. Okay, so B cells and T cells. So a T cell, a T cell is going to um, be responsible for cell mediated response, but there are very special T cells called helper T cells that also help alert the humoral response. So I've got a, a microbe here that says, you narc, I thought we were friends. And then I've got a B cell over here. You see all these little things that are on, on that B cell surface, those are different antibodies, right? And so he says, oh no, which antibody do I use? I've never seen this one before, right? So we're gonna talk about that. You can learn a lot from this cartoon, right? So there's B cells that are moving around your body that have kind of an arsenal of different antigens, to, uh, antibodies, I'm sorry, to see which one of these would match this, um, this particular pathogen. So we're gonna learn about how this body system does that. So again, this is the adaptive immunity, right? Specific, acquired, we're talking about just vertebrates now. In the humoral immunity, we are talking about extracellular microbes. What does that mean, extracellular? It means microbes that are outside the cell. Okay, so if they are outside the cell, this would be the part of the immune system that's going to get them. All right, so here's a B lymphocyte, and I have these um, antibodies that are on the surface here. If that particular one fits with this particular pathogen, then we would um, have the beginning of being able to neutralize that. In the cell mediated immunity, we are going to have cells that get infected, right? And so we have macrophages and dendritic cells that have eaten the bad guys and they take a little piece of the bad guy and they put it on an antigen that they present to a very specific um, integral T cell called the helper T cell. And that helper T cell is going to do things like activating other macrophages to get going and start eating. It is also going to release cytokines that end up um, doing some chemical damage to the cells and end up killing the cells, our cells, but, they are, but they've been infected. So I'm gonna stop right here. Um, and this is where I'll start uh, for the part two of this lecture. And this is another one of those diagrams that's really important. So this might be a good place to pause and actually copy this down into your notes, all right? And that's part one of the immunity lecture. And I hope that that's been helpful and I'll see you in class.